Hello everyone, I'm MateyGM, and welcome to the start of the new series on my channel, the Soulsborne Boss Difficulty Rankings. Seeing as Dark Souls 3 was my very first Soulsborne game ever, I feel like that would be a good place to begin. Keep in mind that these rankings will be based off my own personal difficulty experience, so your list would likely differ from mine, seeing as we all have different skill levels and playstyles. Yes, I know that there's one guy out there who could defeat all these guys on New Game Plus 7 Soul Level 1 with only his left fist in the Calamity Ring, but I'm not that guy, so I won't be ranking the list from his perspective, I'll be ranking it from mine. These rankings will also be based off multiple playthroughs, meaning I've had experience against all these bosses and have fought them multiple times. They will be ranked based off how I see them today, instead of how I saw them when I first faced them. With all that out of the way, let's begin with the easiest boss in all of Dark Souls 3. Coming in at the bottom of the list is Udex Gundia. I'm still not completely sure how to say that name, but this guy will probably be dead before you even get a chance to figure it out. At the beginning of Dark Souls 3, if you'd asked me how tough I found Gundia, I would have said he was incredibly strong, seeing as Dark Souls 3 was my very first ever Souls game, and Gundia was my first ever Soulsborne boss. As the first boss battle I ever experienced in this genre, it was a downright terrifying experience, especially with the second phase transformation. His attacks were also damaging enough to make me nervous of death with every single strike that he landed on me. In my first playthrough, he was a nightmare. However, with a little Soulsborne experience, Kunde's difficulty has gone way down. Now all you have to do to beat him is strafe, get hit safely, and occasionally roll. Or don't strafe, just keep rolling. It doesn't really matter what you do, he's a tutorial boss. He'll go down to nearly anything. If you pick Sorcerer or Pyromancer, you can just shoot him from a distance. Admittedly, he shouldn't be that hard. He's a tutorial boss for crying out loud. But ranking the bosses from my perspective now, Gundir couldn't be anywhere else but the bottom of the list. Now, while I may have found the Deacons to be an absolute joke, recently one of my playthroughs made me change my mind a little bit. If you come to the fight unprepared damage-wise and you get aggressive RNG from the Deacons, the fight can actually be quite tedious. I said tedious, not difficult. Hacking and slashing your way through all of them does take time, and if you're greedy, they can decimate you if they land a perfect combination of hits. I also hate the belly flop attack and how much it stuns you, and the curse build up from the evil spirit bomb can cause panic and recklessness in order to stop it, making you even more likely to be punished. However... If you have damage that is at all tolerable, this fight is an absolute pushover. If you're also using a weapon with some form of sweeping attack, like my Exile Greysword in my first playthrough, this fight will be an absolute joke. Even better, the Red Aura Deacon is often on the outside of the pack, meaning that you won't even have to do that much fighting to get to it. As for Archpope McFuckface, his only advantage is being surrounded by fat people that take quite a few hits to kill. You know what solves that? An alluring skull. If you use one of these skillfully, the second phase becomes just as easy as the first. All of these factors land the Deacons as the second easiest boss in Dark Souls 3. Coming in as the third easiest boss, Walner is also seen as one of the worst bosses in Soulsborne. Personally, I don't see him as that bad, but I do see him as easy. The only reason it's third easiest, and not just the easiest, is due to one thing. Walney's poison. This poison will kill you in mere seconds, and as shown here, if he crawls forward while you're down by his side, you're almost guaranteed to die due to the insane damage output. However, if you play carefully, he's a piece of cake. All you have to do is destroy the three bracelets on his wrists, and then he goes down to the abyss. His only attacks are swinging his arms about, a slam, summoning a couple skeletons, and the only attack I think is worth a damn, Wrath of the Gods from his sword. However, just because an attack is cool, that doesn't make it strong. That sentence could be used to sum up this entire battle. While Walnir is definitely cool, he's just barely off being the weakest boss in the game. Vought is a bit of a difficult case. At the beginning of my Dark Souls 3 experience, I would have said that Vought was tough as shit. Nowadays, it's surprising if I even take a single hit from him. The basic problem with Vought is that he's just so easy to get under and punish. He does do decent damage, but none of that matters if he can't land his hits. In Phase 2, he buffs, meaning you get to unleash the pain, but then he also gets this intimidating charge attack. He charges across the arena 3-4 to four times, and it does good damage, it also stuns you. However, if you know that it's coming, it really isn't that hard to dodge. He then always follows up his charges with his Ice Breath attack, which is incredibly punishable, but it does give you Frostbite. 
However, at that point, you will pretty much be dead anyway if you're aggressive as I am. And if you use the lightning resin you can find in High Wall of Lothric, he's even more of a joke. He was a decent step up in difficulty from Gundare at the time, but now he's just one of the easiest bosses in the game, and for me personally, in the entire series. This ranking is a bit... meh. If we just talk about the boss itself, and only the boss itself, he'd probably be much higher up because if you melee him straight up, he's very challenging and annoying mainly due to his attacks with barely any tell, and his obscenely large health bar. However, if you run past him and to the left, you'll see that part of his arena isn't closed off with a fog wall as is the usual. If you follow that path past a bunch of annoying enemies and one guy with the axe and chain, you'll find a platform which allows you to perform a plunging attack on the boss. Oh well, this isn't anything new. I mean, you can plunging attack the Asylum Demon, so this should do decent damage and make him a bit more handleable way to- WHAT?! That's right, it's a one-hit kill boss. In fact, if you're good enough, which I certainly am not, you can plunging attack him just off a rock in the ground, ending the fight without even going on the path. Either way, it's a pretty boring boss that relies on you not actually fighting the boss itself. It goes down as one of the easiest and worst bosses in the entire series. This fight is easily one of my least favorite in the game, mainly because it just doesn't stand out in any way. All a guy does is fire magic at you, magic that isn't too difficult to dodge, and while it does okay damage, it is unlikely to kill you seeing as you have plenty of time to heal, most of the time. His melee swipes can be parried and also do pitiful damage, so that isn't tough either. In phase 2, he gets a bunch of clones, and if you can't dodge all the spells effectively while locating the real sage, you could and will be destroyed as I have found out the hard way. However, considering the real sage has purple magic and the clones have blue magic, it isn't that difficult to locate him. If you have a build with low vigor, you could be in for a tougher fight, and if you're greedy, there is a high chance you'll die. But this is where the sage stands for my playstyle and builds. Ugh, this boss sucks. I know that today isn't ranking the boss quality, but if it was, this guy would definitely be at the bottom. Anyways, on to the difficulty. He's not really that hard, but he is tedious. In order to deal damage, you have to hit his ball sacks. Yeah, I know that sounds immature, but what else am I supposed to say? In phase 1, you can find him on his left hand, his left foot, and on his crotch. Once you break the crotch balls, the arena collapses beneath his weight, and you fall into the pit of hollows, which is a pretty cool spectacle. However, the broken balls then give birth to a goddamn Wendigo arm. After which, you just have to break more ball sacks, except now, more of them are exposed. All of this is disgusting, and the disgustingness can get in your head. His notable attacks include basic arm swipes in phase 2, this really annoying grab, and the worst attack in all of Dark Souls 3, the Acid Diarrhea Ass Slam. Once it does this attack, it's surrounded by acid, and you can't get near it for about 10 seconds, making the fight go on for even longer, and if you get bad RNG, it'll just keep doing it. It also moves somewhat erratically, meaning the dodging can be a bit tough. This boss is easily my least favorite in Dark Souls 3. And while it's nothing hard, it definitely is the most tedious boss on the list so far. So, Yorm the Giant. While this fight is easily one of my favorites, it also isn't very hard. To start off with, it may seem impossible to defeat him considering his health bar is massive, meaning it'll take a good few years and a lot of repair powder to chip that thing down by yourself. However, if you run past him towards the back of the room, you'll notice a little glinty glow of an item by his throne. That item is a throwback to Demon Souls, the Storm Ruler. And it turns this fight from a seemingly impossible task into a basic joke, seeing as it only takes 5 hits from the Storm Ruler to defeat him by yourself. His attacks are also fairly slow, so you can dodge them, and even if you can't, you have more than enough time to heal up. Also, if you complete Sigurd's questline, he will fight with you, making the Storm Ruler deal less damage, but now Sigurd will be there to attract the attention of Yorm, and if you two-time your attacks correctly, you can stun lock him, making the fight even easier. So, why is Yorm this high up on the list? Well, for one, you could do things the hard way and melee the beast, as pointless as the idea is, and second of all, his attacks actually do decent damage, and as a lower level character, I actually died to him twice, due to carelessness and the damage of his swings. So while Yorm definitely doesn't live up to the difficulty hype you'd expect from a Lord of Cinder, I think he deserves a little bit more credit than he gets.
The old Demon King, for lack of a better word, is fairly unremarkable. He's similar to the other three Demon mini-bosses you could have fought up to this point in the game, but at least he has cool fire attacks, like this pulsating AoE and this meteor shower attack. He's an optional boss, meaning that the difficulty will also be dependent on when you find the King. If you're careless, the run to him from the closest bonfire could consume a few Estus flasks thanks to that worm and the giant crossbow. No matter what level you come here at, the one thing he has going for him is his damage. This guy does hit pretty hard for a mid-game boss, but all of his attacks are easily dodgeable. When you get him down to near death, he will give off one last desperate AoE blast in order to kill you. This attack does do pretty good damage, but that blast consumed the last of this old guy's energy, leaving him a flameless shell that is easily defeated. Just put him out of his misery. So, this guy's a bit tough to rank. As you guys may know, half light Spear of the Church is primarily a PvP fight, but there is also an NPC version if you're playing offline. I'll be putting both of them at this spot, seeing as it fits either way. NPC half light is just that, an NPC. He's fairly tanky, he has a Painting Guardian that spawns to help him out and heal him, and he also has three different playstyles. A sword and a shield, a two-handed sword, and a bow. The sword and shield mode can parry, but otherwise isn't too difficult and the two-handed mode will spam weapon arts from the frayed blade. The bow is kinda of meh, so you want to put the pressure on as soon as he brings that playstyle out. He can also summon these special spear things that remain on the floor as an area hazard, and they do good damage, meaning that if you're careless and walk into them, they could end the fight. Overall, the NPC is more tedious and difficult, but his damage in varied playstyles can provide somewhat of a challenge. As for the players, it really depends on build, skill, and connection. The fact that the boss can't heal makes the fight even easier, and the painting guardians that accompany Half-Light can't really do anything relevant except tank some hits and occasionally get in chip damage. The fact that you can heal with up to 15 plus 10 Estus flasks while they are stuck with nothing just makes it even easier seeing as the guardian barely ever heals them. I've been both the boss and the invader here, and as the boss, in my experience, it comes down to three things. Either you decimate the player, they overcome you in a long battle of skill, or you get ganked 4 to 1. Either way, this fight is definitely the most subject to change on the list, but the PvP can still be a fairly challenging duel depending on your luck, and the NPC is more tedious than actually challenging. Ah, this fight. This fight is fairly hated throughout the Dark Souls 3 community as far as I can tell, and it's honestly not too hard to see why. It's a boss that contains three dogs, an NPC, and the only cool part, a big wolf. The dogs are just dogs, and we all know how popular those are. The NPC is also fairly tanky to damage, and he has alright offense, but he's really nothing special, and he's easily killable if you just know how to fight NPCs by now. The wolf on the other hand is quite a bit fiercer. It'll run all over the arena with a big charge attack, and it does good damage. It also has a frost breath attack, which is slightly better than Vort's, but it's still inconsequential and gives you plenty of time to punish him. Overall, the difficulty partially depends on your ability to kill the grave tender before the wolf gets there, and then it depends on the RNG of the wolf, how much it decides to use its charge attack. The fact that you encounter the wolf twice before the boss fight gives you time to learn its moveset, so that reduces the difficulty. Overall, around the middle of the pack seems to be a good spot for this wolf. So, Osiris. This boss is a bit of an interesting one. I've fought him a total of 5 times, once with Hawkwood as a summon, once in New Game Plus, once where I died, and two solo victories. In those five battles, the experiences differed quite a bit. Osiris' levels of aggression vary, at least in the second phase. The first phase is easy, just dodge as weak attacks and punish. However, in the second phase, the insta-charge does give me quite a bit of trouble, and the erraticness of his attacks is also challenging. Osiris is possibly the most randomly moving boss in the entire main game of Dark Souls 3, and his decent health pool means that you'll have to learn to dodge his attacks for an extended period of time. However, if you can follow the golden rule of Soulsborne, smacking that booty, it does make Osiris easier. Either way, it's still a fairly challenging fight if you get the right RNG. Ah, good old old bitch. This guy has brought me quite a fair amount of frustration. In the Let's Play, I did accidentally summon someone, and in one of my playthroughs, I was using the Farron Greatsword which let me dodge his attacks while outputting my own damage thanks to the crazy flips, and it also gave me a damage boost against the abyssal enemies, which Aldrich has counted as. However, as Kasha, using the Great Sword of Judgment, 
I died to Aldrich around six times. It all comes down to the same thing, his damage. His purple tracking spells do good chip damage, his large spell balls do really good damage, and they're also fast. And for the love of god, watch out for his arrow storm. This is one of the most frightening attacks in the whole game. He shoots his bow upwards and then arrows rain down from the sky onto you. And I'm not talking one or two, I'm talking hundreds. If you get caught in this attack, death is guaranteed. I am fairly good at dodging it nowadays, but I'm still liable to getting clipped by it, and even getting clipped that takes away a good chunk of my health bar. In the second phase, his flaming trail that he leaves behind him also does annoying chip damage, and those purple orbs never go away. He also has a fairly large health pool for this point in the game, so he's a well-balanced foe. However, if you can dodge his spells and you aren't a greedy idiot, he'll eventually take down the Devourer of Gods. The Abyss Watchers, while also being one of the best bosses in the Soulsborne games, are also one of the harder ones, at least at the beginning. I died to the Watchers in my first playthrough at least 8 times. My deaths all pretty much boil down to the same things. Either I get caught in the fire after effects, or I get sneak attacked by the other Watchers in Phase 1. For those of you that don't know how this fight goes, you battle one Abyss Watcher at the beginning. After a while, another one rises from the dead, and then you have to fight two at once, which can be quite daunting, so I find it best to just run away. After a while, a third watch will rise from the dead, but before you start thinking, oh this is unfair, he's actually on your side, meaning that you have a helper in the game for once. This phase really isn't that bad, but you can still be taken by surprise by the first resurrected warrior. After you defeat them, you see an awesome cutscene where one last abyss watcher rises from the dead, brimming with cinder to stop you. In this phase, that watcher gains fire after effects to his attacks, meaning that now you have to be careful before during and after the attack to make sure that you don't get hit. For a fairly early boss, the Abyss Watchers certainly are very challenging for a new Soulsborne player, and they can even give experience players some difficulty. Admittedly, after a while, they do become easier, but they're still challenging enough to end up in the top half. The Dancer of the Boreal Valley seems to get overhyped a lot. I've heard certain individuals call this the hardest boss in the main game. I can't agree with that, the Dancer is just okay. She's challenging, yeah, but not obscenely so. Let's break it down. In Phase 1, her attacks are perfectly dodgeable, and honestly, not even all that damaging. However, in Phase 2, her aggression is up considerably depending on the RNG. She gets two swords with different kinds of elemental damage, and she does get a very terrifying attack. The Spin Wheel of Death. If you get caught in this, your health bar's as good as gone. However, if you can just stick directly behind her ass and roll after the 6th or 7th swing, you'll be completely fine. This lets you get in damage at the start of phase 2, which really does help out in the long run. You also have time to punish during her buff animation, so overall, while certainly difficult, the dancer is perfectly manageable. See this? This is how you make a throwback to Warnstein. The battle with this suit of armor is very cool, and it's a great challenge for the endgame. The Dragon Slayer armor is a challenging fight, not because of tricky mechanics or bullshit, but because of his overwhelming power. Instead of a reskin of Ornstein like the old Dragon Slayer was in Dark Souls 2, this armor gets a whole new build with new strengths. He has a massive great shield that'll block pretty much every attack you throw at it, and a great axe which also has the power of lightning imbued. His swings are fairly fast for a massive suit of armor, and they really hurt. However, they're very well telegraphed, allowing them to be dodged effectively if you're careful. He will fall to one knee if you do enough damage at the start of the fight, but instead of being vulnerable to a riposte, he'll just slam his axe into the ground, which is a cool move from my viewpoint, seeing as it can catch the player off guard if they don't know what's coming. However, in phase 2, the difficulty is upped even further with this weird butterfly thing shooting stuff at you from the distance. While this armor gets some new attacks which I personally struggle to dodge, such as this one attack which drags his axe across the entire arena to slice you down. The butterfly doesn't really give me too much problem, but that's mainly because I dodge way more than I need to. Another problem is the lack of side rails on the arena, which caused an embarrassing amount of death to gravity in one of my playthroughs. I would like to see the builder of this castle, I'm pretty sure this violates protocol. However, if you can dodge effectively, attack wisely, and not fall off a ledge, you'll take down the armor just fine. Coming off of one great boss to another, we have Champion Gundir. Remember in Dark Souls 2 and reskin bosses were just the same with up damage and health? Well, Champion Gundir here wants to shake things up a bit. 
He does have some of the moves that the tutorial bus has, but he also adds in kicks, punches, shoulder bashes, and that's just in phase 1. In phase 2, he gets the stomp attack that can stun you, as well as this intimidating charge that has arguably ludicrous tracking. Seriously, he can turn 180 degrees in a single second to smash you. He also has very high aggression, among the highest in the game, and his grab move can also throw you off the edge of the arena. Just thought I'd let you know about that. But anyways, I really love this boss. It's an adrenaline filled duel between two honourable warriors, and it's a fair challenge to the end. Unless you parry. Then it's easy. Another thing to praise this boss for is that it is a reskinned fight, but it's a reskinned fight done exceptionally well. The boss has actual differences between the original, meaning it fully stands out as its own experience, unlike something like the stray demon from Dark Souls 1, which is just a direct reskin of the tutorial boss. All of these factors earn Gundy his place as a hard boss and as an amazing boss. Ah, uh, the dreaded Pontiff Sullivan. I can't deny that the guy is very tough. For a mid-game boss, his speed and power is extreme, and his combo potential might even be too much for a new player to deal with. I mean, in the Let's Play, I only just made it through the battle in one piece, and that was only because of my summon. His attacks from two hands mean that you can't just keep strafing to one side forever, and if you get caught in his combos, you could be killed quickly. In the second phase, he even summons a stand. Of himself. That's right, you get two Pontus Sullivans for the price of one. I've heard a lot of people say that the second phase makes Pontiff easier because his stand shows what he's about to do, but I don't see it as that big of an advantage. The reason I say this is because even though the stand shows what Pontiff is about to do, you still have to dodge two attacks, and that can be quite challenging, especially if it's something like his AoE or his Flying Slash. However, one advantage that you have over Pontus Sullivan is that he can be parried. He's even easier to parry than Gundia. So you may be wondering why I put Pontiff above the champion. Well, when you're not using parrying, Pontiff Sullivan is harder than Gundyr in my opinion, and I don't normally use parries that much, so for my standard playstyle, Pontiff just edges out Gundyr, as well as the fact that I always take the champion on at a much higher level than I do Pontiff. Overall, Pontiff Sullivan is definitely the hardest boss in the mid-game of Dark Souls 3. Ah, the Twin Princes. First of all, story time. As Raikou, a separate character in Dark Souls 3, I faced off against the princes before I fought them in my Let's Play, and it was a hell of a time. I died to them at least 15 times. They seemed like an insurmountable obstacle. Finally, after grinding up three levels and switching up my entire build, I barely managed to defeat the princes. Seeing as that was my first introduction to this boss, I was dreading having to fight them as Shadow. So I went in there and surprisingly, I beat them in two tries, even though it was a really close battle. I found this surprising, seeing as I hadn't really taken the time to study Lorien's moves at that point, so it shows what difference a playstyle can make when you're facing a boss. Anyways, enough of that, let's discuss why the princes managed to defeat me 15 times in a row. First of all, you have Lorien in the first phase. Despite not being able to walk, Lorien is more dangerous than most swordsmen who actually do use their legs. His sword does pretty good damage, as well as fire damage, and his swings are sometimes a bit tricky to read. However, you should know, as based off the background video, Lorien can teleport. This is what really makes his swings hard to avoid. The teleporting makes his already unpredictable swings even harder to read, meaning that dodging is very difficult, and if you fuck up a dodge, he will punish you for it. This also plays into the two moves that I find the most annoying to deal with. The first of these is where he teleports above you and slams down onto the ground. If he does this move when you don't expect it, he'll catch you off guard and do big damage, making you scramble to heal. The second attack is where he teleports to somewhere in the arena, then holds his sword to the sky, or the roof I suppose, and then his sword starts glowing white. After a few seconds, he slams it down, and a trail of energy is fired. It's pretty avoidable if you know where it's coming from, but if you get caught in it, you will be one shot. However, despite all of this, the first phase is honestly quite manageable, and can be handled easily with some getting good. However, after a very cool cutscene, Lorien is revived and Lothric climbs on his back. You really have to wonder why he didn't just revive Lorien and then teleport back up to his safe spot, but hey, this is the guy who wanted to see the world burn, logic clearly isn't very high on his priority list. Now you have to deal with both of the princes, Lorien and his sword attacks and Lothric firing magic at you. He only has three spells, a fast moving magic projectile that deals surprisingly good damage, a ton of soul masks that can be avoided, and an AoE that he uses after reviving Lorien. However, in this phase, if you hit Lorien in the back, you can damage both princes at once, and you can also get in damage while Lorien is being revived. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, if you manage to kill the wrong prince first, Lothric will just revive him again, 
Lorien seems to have less health in this phase than he does in the first phase, but still, it's annoying having to deal with a teleporting guy with a little monkey on his back. Overall, this is a very challenging fight, but the challenge is honestly quite fair, and it's super satisfying to pull off the victory against these two brothers. The final boss in the main game of Dark Souls 3 is fucking incredible, but it also is very challenging. To sum it up quickly, at the beginning of the fight in Phase 1, he'll attack you using the Filing Greatsword and he'll act kinda like a standard straightsword wielder. He has some swings that have timings that you wouldn't expect, some attacks that go in a completely different direction than the wind-up implied, and some attacks that have follow-ups and some that don't. This makes him quite hard to read, and sometimes his attacks can catch me off guard even after I've faced him so many times. However, once you get his health down a bit, he'll change his fighting style by changing his weapon into either a spear, a staff, or a curved sword, while getting some new tricks with every style. In the sphere mode, he has an awesome grab, some charging attacks, and a miracle AoE that while it doesn't do much damage, it hits pretty fast, so do be prepared to dodge. He can also heal himself, which isn't really a problem from my book, because you get to experience the awesome fight even longer. The easiest mode to deal with is the Sorcerer. He fires some spells at you that can do decent damage, I suppose, but for the most part, they're easy to avoid. However, in my opinion, his most dangerous mode is where he breaks out the Pyromancy and he gets the Falchion. In this mode, he attacks extremely fast, uses Pyromancies, buffs himself, and he can even poison you. Also, even though I've only ever fallen victim to it a single time, this mode can fucking parry you. Seriously, this guy can parry, and when it does, it hurts. In all of his phases, he can utilize this backflip move, which is a neat way of dodging or just putting some space between you and him. And he can also roll like you, even though he doesn't do this very often. All of these modes do very high damage as well, so be careful. Once you kill this phase, then you get to phase 2. It opens with him taking his sword out and slamming it into the ground with a big AoE blast, and then he summons the strength and moveset of Gwyn in a last ditch effort to kill you. Wow. They pretty much took the final boss of Dark Souls 1 and updated him for the modern day, with no weakness to parrying and a few new tricks. He gets Gwyn's Leaping Slash, Gwyn's Bitch Kick, his Grab, his Sunlight Spears, which can be tricky to dodge if you're not prepared, and he even gets his music playing in the background. However, don't think that that's all he has. He also has this new, awesome and devastating attack, which I have referred to as the Wombo Combo. Well, it was either that or Painful Combo of Flaming Destruction. Actually, that last one sounds cooler. This is a 5 piece combo and if you get hit by one attack, you're stuck in it for the rest of the combo, and it does very big damage. It is a fair attack because you can dodge the swings, but it is easy to get clipped if you make a mistake. Also, because you have to kill him twice, this guy has a large amount of HP, making this a battle of endurance to an extent. All of this wraps into an incredible boss that, if you get the right RNG, is among the toughest battles in the entire series. And here we have the first of the four notorious DLC bosses in terms of difficulty. I put this guy at the bottom for a couple of reasons, but that's mainly due to the bosses above them being harder, not the fact that these guys are easy. The Demon Princes are a damn tough fight, mainly because it's three boss battles in one. At the beginning, you have the Demon in Pain and the Demon from Below to worry about. That's right, it's a gang fight. However, it's an amazingly designed gang fight to rival the Abyss Watchers and ONS. Anyways, during the fight, one demon will be lit up, aggressive, and dangerous, while the other demon will be dull colored, stationary, shooting toxic inducing laser beams, and dangerous. You get chances to repose both demons throughout the battle, which is very handy considering the demons have quite large health pools. Eventually, the buff demon will give off an AoE blast, consuming all of its energy and it will enter into a relaxed state, while the previously relaxed demon will buff itself and take over the role of the previous demon. It's a tough juggling act having to fight both of them at once, and it is a very tough challenge if you can't manage Orestus and dodge properly. After you kill both of the demons, the real boss will emerge, the Demon Prince. Depending on what demon you killed last, you'll end up fighting a different Demon Prince. If you killed the demon from below last, you'll get a Demon Prince that uses a heavily damaging, yet heavily punishable beam attack, which is going to be your main window to get damage in. However, if you kill the demon in pain last, you'll get the Fiery Spirit Bomb. This is a very scary attack that I'm sure I would have died to in my let's play if I had just put a few points less in vigor, or was wearing slightly less defensive armor. Obviously, you want to kill the demon from below last, seeing as that fight is way easier, but no matter what prince you end up facing, it's still a great challenge. No matter what demon prince you're facing, you'll still have to deal with flying claw slashes that hit hard, and overall more fire than you'll find in the entire demon ruins. This fight was a great way to introduce players to the difficulty of the Ring City, because while these guys are tough, it's only going to get harder from here.
And now we come to the Nameless King. Remember when people said that this guy was the hardest boss in all of Souls? Turns out he isn't, he's actually quite beatable, but it certainly takes a lot of skill to do it. For starters, this is two boss battles in one. Nameless rides in on his flying dinosaur chicken thing, and then you have to kill it. It has a varying selection of attacks, ranging from easily iframeable fire breath to firing wind waves at you from its wings. Nameless also takes the time to attack you by throwing lightning bolts, and he even has this lightning slam attack that I still find hard to dodge at times. However, with a repost chance, the King of Storms really isn't that tough anymore. I may lose a flask or two due to bad dodging, but it really is more of a speed bump. If I was ranking the King of Storms by itself, it would come in below half light. However, when the King gets off of his pet, he absorbs its strength to become even stronger. It's honestly intimidating, and he certainly lives up to the look. You'd think that by killing the dragon, the rider would become weaker, but no, turns out he's far more dangerous than that chicken ever was. He has a very large health pool, as well as a varying selection of moves, such as a wind wave or a wind slash with due large damage, and his spear is incredibly damaging. He also has several combo attacks, which aren't impossible to dodge by any means, but I do have this habit of dodging too early that still makes me get hit. It seems that he sometimes switches up the timing for his attacks, making them even tougher to avoid. He also has a powerful grab move that can take you down to critical health if you're not expecting it, but he then throws you far enough away from him so that you can heal. His phase 2 gives him some ranged lightning attacks that caught me by surprise at first and they can finish you off if you're not expecting it. However, you do get two separate repost chances in this phase, and his attacks are all possible to dodge with some practice. Overall, it's a very well balanced endurance fight that is a very tough challenge to overcome, but there are still three fights out there that transcend the challenge of the Nameless King. Now we have the second DLC boss, and it's honestly a contender for the hardest boss in the game. I'll get to the reasons for this later, but for now, I'll go over each phase. The first phase isn't really that tough as long as you can dodge effectively and track her invisibility jump, but she does have a damaging grab move and fairly dangerous combos, along with some frost damage. However, with high potential to stun her and her low health pool, this phase is fairly easy, easier than Osiris. However, then we get to phase 2 via a cutscene and it's a gank fight. It's similar to Ornstein and Smo, with Freed being fast and combo-y, and Father Ariandel being slow, but damn strong. He hits like a truck and deals big fire damage, and Freed can even heal him. Freed herself doesn't change much, but her frost attacks do get a bit more dangerous in my opinion. However, as long as you can just keep wailing on Ariandel, this phase will be manageable, seeing as they share a health bar. So, these two phases would place the boss battle just below Lorien and Lothric. However, we then get to the third phase with goddamn Black Flame Freed. Somehow resurrected even after being killed twice, Freed gets insanely more powerful. She gets, as her name suggests, Black Flames that give out insane damage, and her frost damage is at its strongest with a huge area of effect. She has insane combos, her invisibility jump is even tougher to pin down, her Black Flame attacks can one-shot you, and her health bar is actually fairly decent now. But now, we get to the part that makes Freed a true danger. Her speed. Freed has recovery time and speed, similar to what you'd find in Bloodborne, whereas you're was stuck with the mechanics of Dark Souls 3. This is how she makes up for her weakness to being staggered, she can jump away before you can hit again. This makes some attacks unpunishable, as she will escape before you can strike. However, she can sometimes choose not to jump away, which is how I beat her for the first time by hitting her five times in a row. However, this happens really. However, when I fought this boss in my Let's Play at around level 103, she was very tough but beatable, and I beat her on my second try. However, when I fought her as Kasha at around level 70 with a plus 5 Moonlight Greatsword and over 30 intelligence and strength, it was nearly impossible to even get past the second phase due to my lack of damage output, and even to this day I still haven't beaten her on that character. This fight is crazy, yet mostly fair, and a very real contender for the best fight in Dark Souls 3, as well as the hardest. However, in my opinion, there are two bosses that provide a bit more of a challenge than Sister Freed and Father Ariandel. So we come now to the final two bosses on the list. I know that it's predictable having these two as the hardest, but hey, it's the truth, at least for me. Slave Knight Gale is an amazingly fun and extremely tough fight, and it takes Nameless's endurance battle and ups the difficulty by a lot. For one, his health bar is massive, and it takes forever to whittle down. Seriously, I had a plus 10 heavy exile greatsword with 50 strength, and it still took ages. Second of all, unlike Nameless, his attacks are quite a bit harder to read, and it often results in poorly timed dodges, which of course leads to big damage. His first phase is the most unpredictable of them all, and while it's not unbearably hard, it still poses a very big challenge. 
He has several leaping strikes and even a combo attack similar to Soul of Cinder. However, he will stagger after 3, 4 or 5 hits, so you do get a window to heal or get more damage in. Once you manage to take away a third of his health, an awesome cutscene plays and he takes a more humanoid stance. This isn't just an aesthetic change, this guy is now almost a completely different fight. He gets a plethora of new attacks, like throwing magic frisbees at you, shooting you tons of times with a crossbow, using hard hitting combos with a sword, and now he follows up all of his sword swings with an attack from his cape that can actually be fairly troublesome. However, the cape is honestly less effective of an after effect than the Abyss Watch's fire, so if you can dodge that, you can probably dodge this too. Personally, I see Phase 2 as the easiest phase of the fight. However, Phase 3 changes that up completely. His combos become longer, faster, he can teleport, and he can even fucking call down lightning. I see Phase 3 as the hardest phase, personally, as he combines pretty much all of his attacks into new and awesome combos that deal serious damage. There's just so much going on that it's hard to count for everything, and you're almost bound to get hit by something that you didn't see coming. Even in New Game Plus, with my character around level 150, I still barely pulled off my victory against him. The only advantages that you have over him is that you'll briefly stagger after every few hits in all the phases, which will allow you to heal or get a hit in. However, even with this, he's still a very great threat in every second of the battle, and the endurance required to come out on top in this fight is immense. But there is still one fight which takes all of this to the next level. Call me cliche, but there really was no other option. Dark Eater Medea is one of the best bosses in Dark Souls 3, and it's also the hardest, admittedly by a small margin. It's pretty easy to see why. His attacks are hard to dodge, do massive damage, and his health power is fucking gigantic. Admittedly, towards the end of the fight, you do get a chance for a very damaging repost, but first you have to get his health down to that level, and it is a chore. He moves very fast for something so big, around the huge arena, and seeing as the head is the only area of his body that takes acceptable damage, you're forced to fight him head on. I don't really have much of a strategy to give, apart from stay on your toes and only attack the head. There are also other tactics, such as using lightning or iframing the downwards fire breath, and honestly, you'll need all the damage you can get. Speaking of which, iframing the fire can often go wrong and lead to massive damage, as I found out the very hard way. Also, for the love of god, avoid the grab attack. It's not that hard to, seeing as it has an obvious tell, but if you get caught in it, it really hurts. His other attacks include a massive combo that if you get caught in it, it's almost certain death. However, if you can get behind him while he's doing the combo, you'll just be able to wait it out which gives you time to heal or buff. He also has fire drive by attacks which can be tricky to avoid, and his more focused fire breath attacks are also followed up by this laser beam, and the area that the laser covers will explode a few moments later. Let me tell you, this laser really hurts, it's among the highest damage output a boss has in Dark Souls 3. Phase 2 isn't too different, but he does get this attack with a ton of projectiles, but it isn't that tough to avoid. The one advantage that you have over him is that he won't always get the chance to use the new attacks he gets in Phase 2 because of the repost shaving so much of his health away. Overall, Dark Eater Medea is an incredibly difficult challenge that pushes the player to their limits, but it does so in a fun and fair way that easily earns his spot as one of the best bosses, and my choice for the hardest boss in Dark Souls 3. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed my very first Soulsborne boss ranking video. If you guys have any feedback, leave it in the comment section below. Tell me what you think of my list, and what yours would look like. Be sure to mention all the bosses, not just the obvious ones. I'll be doing more of these for Dark Souls 1, 2, Bloodborne, and possibly Demon Souls, so be sure to subscribe for more if you enjoyed this kind of video. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you all next time.